Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the launch of Cornwall's localism strategy. Thank you very much for joining us virtually uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Simon Mould. I am the head of communities. Um, I just wanted to give a quick uh, welcome to the proceedings of this morning. So just so you're all aware, the session is recorded for future use or for those that can't attend today. So there will be throughout today's session a number of opportunities to ask questions as we go through the session. Due to the number of people that are attending, questions should be written into the meeting chat and will be answered during the meeting. As some of you may show on the system as a guest or your mobile number, can I please ask to help us when we're asking questions that you can put your name first before your question and that will help us when we're looking at the questions for you. Can I please ask that you add your questions into the chat bar at any time during the session today? And if there's a question that you see that's similar to something you'd like to know, you have the ability to use the like button and click on that question. And the more likes on a question, that will also help us understand the key things that people are interested to understand and find out more about. Just to give you some uh, reassurance as well, at the end of the day, all of the questions that have been put into this session will be answered and will inform a question and answer sheet that we'll send out to all of those of you that have been registered for the launch today. So no one will have a question unanswered. So lastly, just for me, the running order for today is firstly, we'll have an introduction from Councillor Edwina Hannaford, Portfolio Holder for Climate Change and Neighbourhoods. I'm then delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Councillor Howard Sykes, MBE, Vice Chair of Local Government Association. We'll then hear from Jesse Hampshire, Service Director, Strategy and Engagement, who will talk to us about the recent Cornwall we want. I will then uh, provide an overview of our localism uh, strategy, uh, and that will then be followed by Sarah Mason, County Executive Officer of Cornwall Association for Local Councils, and then finally, uh, over to Helen Boardman, Chief Executive of the Voluntary Sector Forum. Throughout the section, there will be opportunities to answer questions. And at the end, there will be a reflection piece for us to decide collectively on how we want to take this forward. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy uh, the next two hours. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Councillor Hannaford to say a few words about the significance of this document. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the launch of Cornwall's localism vision and strategy. This launch highlights what the document contains and the work that has been um, undertaken to inform this document. The recognition it is received from MHCLG, that's the Ministry of Housing, um, Communities and Local Government, Exeter University, locality, and most importantly, the voices of our communities through our town and parish councils, voluntary sector colleagues, CALC, and my Cornwall councillor colleagues. You may remember as long ago as 2016, uh, 2018, I visited all the community network panels seeking your views and your thoughts. Then we held a mini local localism conferences. Um, I remember going to Helston, Truro, Bodmin and Bude. And again at the localism conference in Weybridge in 2019. And there was incredible, really good attendance at that one. So the new localism vision and strategy is a combination of two years of research, engagement with academia, government, Cornwall's parishes and towns and the voluntary sector to bring to life a fully informed and supported vision for the future of localism in Cornwall. The document has already had support uh, from MHCLG, as I said, who would like Cornwall to inform the forthcoming local recovery and devolution white paper. I think that's an acknowledgement of the good work that we and you are doing. Uh, I also engaged with uh, locality, Exeter University and Lord Kerslake, who was leading uh, the future of localism papers in government. Also informing the vision with thousands of residents who shared their hopes for Cornwall in the Cornwall we want and shaped our vision to be leading a sustainable um, in sustainable living for the well-being of future generations. Everyone has a role to play to create the Cornwall we want. Over one in three residents have told us they want to work with others in their community, and they do. And seven in 10 people say they are willing to sustain changes to how they travel and work to not only tackle, um, to tackle uh, climate change and to the benefit of nature. 
The strategy sets how, out how we will empower and work with our compassionate communities across Cornwall to achieve our shared vision for the future. We in this virtual room are critical to how we enable and support this to come to fruition. You, as key leaders and voices of place, I'm sure you will join me in acknowledging how the power of localism has been the bedrock of Cornwall's response to the coronavirus pandemic so far. Just as thousands of daily acts of community kindness have helped people through lockdown, this spirit of uh, Gwilin Warbuth, together we can, will aid Cornwall's recovery and renewal from the pandemic at the right time. This is a strategy for the council as we de develop our operational plans, shape our policies and embed the principles of localism across the organisation in the same way as that we are embedding climate change actions in everything we do. But this plan is also for the whole of Cornwall. We want to ensure all our partners embed localism in everything they do. We are not quite there yet, but this launch of this document will strengthen our resolve and embed the ethos of localism into all we do. I think it's really important at this point to say that the communities of Cornwall have not waited for this strategy to take action. They haven't needed permission to ask. This is not a hierarchy. Communities across Cornwall have just got on with it, caring for in need. The strategy does, however, provide a base document, the principles by which the council and our partners should operate going forward. There's some best practice pointers and there's some measures of success. The support on the ground and acknowledgement through a range of academia and agencies just so shows how far localism has progressed in Cornwall and how proud we should be of our efforts to work alongside each other for the benefit of the whole of Cornwall. Um, I'd also like to thank Scrutiny for uh, their advice and guidance. I think it's been to Scrutiny three times um, and was finally signed off by NOSC, that's Neighbourhoods Overview and Scrutiny, on the 3rd of September. Uh, since then, we've engaged with the Voluntary Sector Forum and the Cornwall Associations of Local Councils. Um, sure that we're all working together around the four principles of localism which are outlined in the strategy and are at the heart of our future working relationships. I'm really proud to have these bodies working as one uh, to these common principles. Mm. To me, it doesn't matter who undertakes actions. It's about who is best placed to take that action and ideally closest to where those decisions will have most impact. The document outlines the key principles um, that all of the national research around the future of localism has identified and reflects the themes of the four uh, newest and uh, most relevant publications um, supporting um, this document. So they are uh, and include um, written by locality and Exeter University, research uh, through the Town and Parish Councils, which some of our our colleagues in town and parish councils took part in, and some of them were, um, you know, not so um, complimentary, but that's all good learning. And that was in May 2019, but some really good positive stuff. The changing role of town and parish councils in Cornwall, again, Exeter University in June uh, 2019, power partnership, learning on localism with four local authorities, that was locality in September 2019, and the power partnership. Um, learning from Cornwall, uh, that was again uh, locality. The localism vision and strategy is a critical enabling strategy to help strengthen communities, which aims to improve people's lives. At the end of the day, all we want to do is enhance and improve the lives of people in Cornwall. At the heart of the document is our goal for localism and the four underpinning principles that have been developed and to build on the strong relationship and the foundations we've built with our town and parishes, the voluntary sector and communities. And this is over a, a decade. So those principles are community assets and services, community decisions, community action and community support. And we'll hear um, put a little bit more meat on the bones of those principles uh, later uh, this morning. 
The document gives examples whereby implementing those four principles, the council, town and parish councils, the voluntary sector have all worked in partnership to deliver services and provide continuing support for assets that our communities feel are of great value to them. At the meeting with MHCLG on the 1st of December last year, Cornwall was identified as being ahead of the game in terms of localism and devolution. And the, we've been offered the opportunity to significantly form and shape the devolution and recovery white paper that's currently being written and expect to be published um, directly, not quite sure. Um, you might not always feel we are good at this, but outside Cornwall, we are recognised as leaders in localism. But of course, we can always do better. This is not the end of the work, though, but the beginning of our next conversation. And am I excited to see how um, together we can bring this vision and strategy to life to help realise our collective vision to be leading in sustainable living for the well-being of future generations. This document is high level strategy. We need to put that meat on the bones. And in my view, this should be undertaken as a co-production together. I would finally just like to thank everybody for attending today's launch and extend an invite to everyone to work with us to enshrine the principles of localism in all we do to make our communities healthy, safe and resilient. Thank you very much. I think I'm handing over to Councillor Sykes, I think. That's correct. Good morning. Good. Um, good, good, good morning. Uh, and can I just say, I'm, I, I rather wish I was there rather than here as I look out my window and we've got two inches of snow here. I don't know what the weather's like there. Um, but can I say it's a real pleasure uh, to join you. Uh, today as you move forward on what I describe as your localism journey. Um, my name is Councillor Howard Sykes. I'm one of the vice chairs of the Local Government Association and I'm leader of the Liberal Democrat group at the LGA. Um, it's always dangerous when you do these things. I counted up how many years I've been a councillor and it's 32 years now um, and that's as a, uh, a unitary councillor. But I've also been a parish councillor as well and that's what I did first and still do and that's a real passion of mine and I'm pleased to see parishes are well embedded uh, in the document you're launching today. So I'll speak in two or three bits. Um, I'm conscious you've got quite a few people talking to you so I'll have a canter through. I'll hang around if there's any questions I can help with uh, but you've got some real experts here. So um, as a Liberal Democrat we have a real commitment to community politics which is a dual approach acting inside and outside institutions of the political establishment to help organise people in their communities. Um, we believe in devolving power to the lowest practical level. A lot of people talk about that, but in my experience, very few people do it. And where there are none, uh, removing the barriers to the creation of additional parish and town councils, as well as neighbourhood forums or other mechanisms that communities choose to have, not imposed on them, choose to have. We believe in strengthening the powers of principal local authorities of key areas such as education, health and care, transport planning, housing and environment. Liberal Democrats also believe that decisions over policies and spending should be made at the lowest possible level. These levels will be different for different types of activity. And we believe this means that systems will look very different in different parts of Britain. And that's right. One size does not fit all, and what's right for Cornwall will be very different from what's right for somewhere else or the community I represent. Now, more than ever, as we fight COVID-19, a top-down centralised approach has been shown not to work. Local solutions led by local people and institutions are the way forward. And hopefully if one good thing comes out of this virus, it should be a renewed call for some real localism. Now back to your journey and the document you're launching today. As I understand it, there's been three years of research engagement, academic support, town and parish, some of the most critical audiences I ever come across and voluntary sector input. Um, and I know uh, Lord Kerslake or Bob, and I've done some work uh, with Bob, who is 
the president of the LGA, uh, is very happy to be quoted to say that Cornwall offers significant learning for localism policy and practice. Localism within Cornwall is advanced compared to other local authorities in England. I'll just say that again, localism within Cornwall is advanced compared to other local authorities in England. You are ahead of the rest of the local government family and that's why I'm pleased to be here. This strategy sets out and echoes the LGA's ideals with regards to building resilience in communities and ensuring they have a stake and a voice and how to make things happen. What takes place now is all based on the principle of co-design and co-production. This is a vision and strategy for Cornwall as well as one for the council. There's some great examples of localism in action in the document and I commend you have a good read of it. This session today is not just about how uh, we got to this point, but how you collectively want to take it forward. And we've got bits on the agenda where you can input into that. So, so three questions, I suppose. How do you make this meaningful for your towns and parishes? How do you make it meaningful for your voluntary organisations? And how do you make this meaningful for the residents of Cornwall? The LGA and I support your ambitions make this work and work well that the eyes of local government of the local government family are firmly fixed upon you and more importantly the people of Cornwall want and need this to work and to be built on I'm sure you won't let either of us down um, enjoy your day and uh, I'm really pleased to be here thank you Thank you. Simon, thank I believe you. would you thank like you, Councillor Sykes, and uh, thanks very much for your kind words. Um, I'd now like to hand over, if I may, um, to uh, my colleague uh, Jesse Hampshire. Uh, Jesse will give an introduction into um, the 2050 uh, document, the Cornwall We Want. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much, Simon, and hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to join you here today. Um, this is the first uh, strategy to be published following um, the extensive work over the summer to create the shared vision for. Cornwall to be leading in sustainable living, um, which Councillor Hannaford outlined in her opening um, presentation. Um, and it's fantastic to see uh, to see this outlining how localism in Cornwall can unlock that power of community to drive change and create the Cornwall we want for future generations. So I don't know who's driving the slides, but if we could move on, I will endeavour to give you just a bit of a little bit of background on that vision um, to set the scene uh, for Simon's presentation on the um, on the localism strategy itself. So as many of you know, in spring 2020, our COVID-19 resident survey found an absolutely unprecedented public demand for change uh, for a better future. Um, we've since put that survey online and over 2,200 people completed it over the summer. And we found that appetite for change only grew over time, um, with fewer than 3% now saying they want everything to go back to how it was before the pandemic. And 9 in 10 saying they hope we will have learned lessons from this crisis as a country. Next slide, please. So we launched the Cornwall We Want um, as a big conversation um, with uh, the people of Cornwall over the summer to hear more from our residents about the changes that they wanted to see um, and help shape our vision for Cornwall's recovery and renewal. Um, it was it was a difficult time, wasn't it? Because uh, normally we'd be out and about um, on the streets of Cornwall hearing hearing from people um, and ongoing local restrictions uh, meant we had to find a different way uh, to hear from all voices. Uh, and you can see the different ways that we uh, we gave people the chance to have their say there on the screen. Overall, we had over 25,000 people visit our online platform, um, which we created to, to let people have their say whilst, uh, whilst in lockdown or socially restricted. And we also heard direct from over 900 residents uh, who took place in discussions through roundtables, focus groups 
and live streamed discussion events which were subsequently viewed back over 16,000 times by people in Cornwall. Next slide please. There's a full feedback report published um, if you want to find out more about what we heard from residents. Um, but overall, the four big themes and hopes that we heard were calls for a Cornwall that's less reliant on tourism, growing our green economy. For a cleaner, greener Cornwall with more space for nature. For a fairer, more inclusive and compassionate Cornwall and for a future where more decisions about Cornwall are made by Cornwall. Next slide, please. We also heard, um, and this I found particularly encouraging, uh, a really strong and positive recognition that everyone has a role to play in shaping the Cornwall we want for future generations. In our survey, over four in five people said they would be happy to sustain changes in the way they work and travel so that we keep those benefits for nature that we saw in lockdown. Over half of people in Cornwall had helped others in their community during the pandemic and perhaps most encouragingly, one in three told us they want to help others in their community in future. Next slide, please. So we took everything we heard and we fed that into our shared vision for Cornwall's future, um, for Cornwall to be leading in sustainable living for the well-being of future generations. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We heard that sustainable living is more important to people now than ever. Um, there was a really strong desire to adopt ways of living that create more space for nature and more equitable outcomes for people, making Cornwall a really inclusive place where everyone can thrive. And this is at the heart of our vision. Next slide, please. I should say at the beginning, um, we know that sat here in 2020, wherever we are sat, um, we can't foresee all the obstacles that we may have to navigate on the way um, or all the opportunities that might arise that enable us to speed our progress. So Gill and Warbath, together we can, the Cornwall plan will be under regular review and become more sophisticated with, e with each iteration. What is important is that we're all steering towards the same shared goals because we know that together we can make faster progress towards the Cornwall we want. Next slide, please. Um, just to show you the kind of uh, the, the way in which Cornwall's come beh together behind this plan, um, it's been formally endorsed uh, by all partners on the Cornwall and Isles of Civil Leadership Board. And it's also been formally considered and approved by the boards of um, uh, and decision making bodies of a wide range of organisations and partnerships, as you can see there. Um, the Environment Secretary and local MP George Eustace has said this vision shows how Cornwall can lead the way in building back better and greener. And it was a particular pleasure to hear Cornwall's youth MPs endorse the way the vision puts the concerns of children at the heart of plans for Cornwall's future, given that commitment to future generations. Next slide, please. And um, so the plan, hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it. Um, it's on the website. Uh, if you haven't, this is just a very high level overview. It outlines six transitions uh, to make to achieve our vision of leading in sustainable living. Those are, as you can see, there, organised around um, six high level themes. And I'll give you a very brief flavour of some of the goals under those themes and I hope, hope you'll see that they really are ones that everyone has a role to play, not least the fantastic communities of Cornwall. Next slide please. So transition one, a creative carbon zero economy and some of the goals outlined there are such as no one in Cornwall being unwillingly out of work with all jobs paid the real living wage. Cornwall being carbon neutral and producing four times as much clean energy as now. Growth in green jobs, making tourism a smaller part of a larger and more resilient economy. And everyone spending more with local businesses to build wealth in our communities. Next slide, please. Transition two focuses on sustainable food, land and seas and the kind of goals that you'll find articulated there include no child in Cornwall being dependent on food banks for nutrition. 
growing nature with twice as much land in active management for environmental growth and clean bathing waters for all of Cornwall's coastal communities. Next slide, please. Transition three focuses on thriving places with decent homes and the kind of goals it articulates are an end to street homelessness and fuel poverty in Cornwall. Cornwall's communities being well connected with twice as many journeys made by green and active travel and a reduction in road traffic with zero deaths on Cornwall's roads. Next slide, please. Transition four focuses on people's potential, equality, education and entrepreneurship and the kind of goals uh, it articulates you can you can see there. Next slide, please. Transition five focuses on safe, healthy and resilient communities um, and the localism strategy and local communities have a part to play in all of these transitions, but particularly in this one. The kind of goals that it articulates are for people to be living well and independently for longer, enjoying good health for at least five extra years of life. Not least because compassionate communities are using their talents and resources to help each other to live, learn and age well. And for no one in Cornwall to feel lonely, with more people saying they feel they belong to their neighbourhood. Next slide, please. The sixth and final transition uh, is for a digital revolution to underpin our goals of sustainable living. And we've seen, haven't we, during the, re the last year, how important it is for everyone to be digitally included and connected. Uh, we also want to see Cornwall at the forefront of using smart technologies to help people live well and connect with social networks and services, as well as bringing benefits to local businesses and jobs. Next slide, please. You'll see in the plan um, that partners across Cornwall are really serious about driving this change. Um, and there's an outcomes framework within the plan to help us track and drive progress, which is based upon Kate Rayworth's donor economics. Um, and you can see in the plan the measures of success that will be used to track and guide our progress. Next slide, please. So I hope that gives you uh, an introduction uh, to the to the kind of due north that the localism strategy is is going to be a really, really essential part of helping us to achieve. Um, and I will hand over now to Simon, I believe, is going to uh, take us through the contents of that in more detail. Thank you very much, Jesse, uh, and thank you to the speakers that I'm, I'm just following on. It's most appreciated. So um, thank you all. So uh, what I'd like to do now is provide an overview and just go into a little bit more detail for you on the localism um, vision and strategy. Um, what I did want to do as well, though, is just sort of reflect for a second. It was the first time I'd heard the, the quote um, that Councillor Sykes uh, presented from Lord Kerslake. And, and I just hope it was something that uh, all, all were able to uh, hear and reflect on. Um, and just sort of take a moment to reflect on the way in which Cornwall over the last 10 years has really built uh, a very clear approach of localism. It might not always have had the name localism, but that approach and that way um, that we have worked collectively together in place, for place, uh, has definitely been rec recognised on the, on the national uh, perspective. And sometimes I think this may be something that we forget. Um, so hopefully you've all received a copy of the document uh, with your link uh, to this event and I hope you've had time to look at it. Um, as Councillor Hannaford uh, said in her introduction, um, one of the things as I go through this though is I do hope that we see this very much as a, as a start to the next steps of how we want to shape this together. So um, this strategy is very much a high level document at the moment which outlines those four principles and through this session and hopefully through many sessions that we come forward, we can collectively look at how we date the direction and use this document to help us shape the way in which we move on to our next stages of localism. So within the document, I think one of the key things that we talk about is how the power of localism has definitely been seen as the bedrock of Cornwall's response to coronavirus. Um, Jesse and Councillor Hannaford both spoke just around how uh, thousands of residents have shared their hopes for Cornwall uh, through the Cornwall we want 
and help shape the vision to leading in sustainable living in the well-being and future of generations. And collectively now, it's how we all get behind that and how hopefully we feel that we can use the strategy as a document to help start to drive that forward. It, for me, the document echoes and speaks to our collective approach to localism, which has been built over a decade. And of course, as we've discussed and can't be ignored, our most recent experiences of how we've worked in place to support and enable our community's response to a pandemic of a scale and impact unseen in recent times. I hope when you consider the amazing work over these recent months, this resonates with you and something that you're able to take pride and a reflection upon. We do see this document as critical enabling strategy to help strengthen our, our communities and improve people's lives. It pro provides a number of principles which help us unlock and maximise the power that our communities hold. Um, I just wanted to expand on some of the points that Councillor Hannaford said though, because what this document isn't, is it isn't a Cornwall Council document. Um, we deliberated long and hard as to where this document sat and how we wanted to present and what we wanted to create. And through the research and through the conversations that we had, it felt that this is appropriate to be branded uh, aligned with the 2050 vision. And it was our document, our collective document that held our aspirations and views as opposed to a Cornwall Council document. Talking to a number of partners, some of the key things that have come out is how this document should and can be used as a mandate, if you like, something that we can all draw from, something that we can build on, but all something that we can hold each other to account to, to ensure as we move forward, uh, we are being consistent in the approach. And I think just looking at some of the questions already through the Q&A that have been posted, hopefully that will help and strengthen our relationship and build that trust. Sometimes I know joined from my experience and listening to you and when we work in a community or uh, with you, we can approach things from a parent child perspective or from an organisational silo standpoint, going in saying this is your problem or issue and this is what you need. From a community organisation to organisation perspective, I've heard how this feels, frequently described as done to rather than done with. The challenge of changing the done to to the done with is a fundamental principle that sits within this strategy and again something that collectively we need to hold each other to account over. We hope having done so much work here that there's nothing that cannot be agreed with everyone in principle as ultimately hopefully reflects all of the conversations we've had. There are some real excellent examples of localism in action in the document and of course we know there are many others that haven't made it into the document and we know some of you are attending today. What we would like to do is thank you for your contribution um, as well as making sure we look at how we start to capture those examples so that we all have a wealth of information that we can draw on and share from. And again, that's one of the underlying things that we'll be looking to work with you on is how do we build a library of case studies, big and small, that we're able to draw upon and help strengthen our approach for Cornwall. The document also outlines what we will continue to do, what we want to achieve and how we know we'll know if we're successful. This requires not just the council, but all of us to work together to make sure this works. And I hope that this is the start and we can together further develop this section. What I want to do now is just focus a little uh, on the uh, vision for the localism, healthy, safe and resilient communities and the four principles which are introduced on page eight of the document that have been developed from the work carried out with our research partners and building on our strong foundations that we've built together with town and parish councils, the voluntary sector and communities over the, dec over the last decade. These are less about governance, less about structures of control and more about how we work together. I think there was a really insightful point in Councillor Hannaford's introduction where she spoke about how communities did not wait for permission in response to COVID. And for me, this is very much around how we're wanting to move forward on this strategy, not something that contains, not something that governs, but something that seeks to give permission, something that seeks to set out opportunity of how we may collectively work together for the best of our communities. The council has also agreed as a partner to adopt these principles and ensure they underpin the council's priorities and how they assist in shaping the council's future delivery plans. 
This commitment has been clearly signed up to by Cabinet, been scrutinised through all of the scrutiny committee and also had complete endorsement through the corporate strategic directors. So again, I note already that we're starting to get communication through in the chat bar. And for me, this is actually something that has to happen across the whole council, as it does across the whole system, as it does across the relationships to which we all hold of how we bring these into our organisations and start to look at how we can make them real. I'm very conscious that ask, of course, isn't simple and will take time. The principles, as you can see on the screen, support the notion in some ways of an asset based community development, looking at how we may cultivate the power of communities and tap into their inherent skills and passions. To do this, we need to ensure that we look at how we support confidence in taking action, how we can build that confidence in place and how we can work with them and us to improve the communities that we connect with and are part of. Something I hope that you'll all agree that we all benefit from in helping us move toward healthy, safe and resilient communities. And probably at the time when we wrote that, um, we weren't aware where we were going to be in the COVID response. So now I think that is a task probably more now than ever that's in our minds of how we move from response to recovery from COVID and look at how we build on healthy, safe and resilient communities, not just from the response of COVID, but for the future, as some of the challenges that COVID leave behind will be there for us to work with for many a year. As Councillor Hannaford noted, the document gives us clear examples of how collectively we have worked together in partnership to deliver services and provide continuing support for the assets that communities feel are of great value. So if we look at the four principles that are on the screen, what I wanted to just do is just go through a little of them each one by one, just to draw some attention for you on them. So if the first, if you look at community assets and services, over the last 10 years, we've put over 285 assets and services in control uh, of local communities. Um, this hasn't always been straightforward. It's been a learning exercise, but the key thing that's come out of that is the power of the relationships that we've drawn on together to make that happen. And, at, and every time we've learned more and we've shared with one another and looked at how we can continue to develop that. Those assets aren't just physical. We've also looked at how we can look at running services differently and how they can move forward. And I know after um, feedback from the larger councils meeting last week, that there were some real prickly issues that have been discussed and considered. And we want to make sure that we bring all of the parties together to look at how we can start to shape and consider what approaches are available to us and how we can start to move that forward. Looking at where we sit at the moment, we've got Cornwall Council has over six and a half thousand assets ranging from large operational buildings to small community buildings and spaces. We need to make sure that we open up conversations following on from today of looking at how best those facilities and assets are utilised, not making a decision from within, but actually going out and talking with you, communities, organisations to see if these things can help unlock different ways of working and different power of place to really support those local communities. So we will be keen to work with you and understand how that works. Also looking at how we go out and work in place to find solutions to problems that may um, require support from a whole host of different people. Again, I make no apology for drawing on the COVID experiences. Um, if you look at some of the rich and fantastic agile responses that came about in place, these weren't because of permission was given. It was because the right people came together at the right time and where they became really successful is where we had different people having meaningful conversations and looking at how they could join those up. So for us under that uh, first community assets and services, it's very much about not just looking at bricks and mortar, but it's looking at the what and the how and how that can help make difference in place. One of the real shining examples I think of that one definitely came through the library service work and how collectively through the devolution of what initially looked just like pure libraries actually blossomed a fantastic partnership which now sees more books being borrowed within our libraries and those libraries now being used as community hubs for a much wider range of services. So if I move on next then to um, community decision. Um, which you can see on page nine uh, of um, the document. 
Again, this is very much linking into where Jesse has just led us to, of making sure that our communities are much more involved in the decisions that affect them and that we have a far greater level of participatory approach in the way that we work. Of course, minded on that though, and that this document is for Cornwall, it's a challenge for all of us. So when we're working through our town and parish councils, through the voluntary sector, in communities, how do we all make sure that that's something that we do? How do we make sure that we collectively link our conversations together? So when we're going out and having these conversations in place, we can maximize the opportunity of that conversation and look at where we may all be collectively occupying similar conversations or similar places so that we have an ability to potentially speak with greater clarity and where possible one voice and look at how we maximize that opportunity of those communications. Ultimately for us through these decisions, it's how we help our communities get the best possible outcomes for the people that are working in those places. And again, I'm very conscious and I'll talk about it later, co-production, co-produce, all very buzzwords, but ultimately it's about how do we sit together over a cup of tea and a sticky bun and have a proper conversation about the true issues that are happening and how we draw upon what are the right and most appropriate skills and resources that we have collectively which of course includes the communities at the heart of that conversation. If I move on then to community action and something again that we've seen so strongly uh, most recently. Um, through that community action, it is again looking at how we make sure that we've got the strength uh, in place and how we work co collaboratively with those people and residents. So again, um, okay, reflecting on Councillor Hannaford's comments, it's less about asking for permission and actually it's about letting go and how we ensure that those right conversations are happening but moreover we feel uh, that we can collectively lose control or we can pass control to the most appropriate place that can make those decisions but some of that is how we help build and support that in the first place how we understand what action is available and how we maximize those pieces and again, COVID has really brought forward that to great levels of uh, attention for me in how that's been achieved. And I know when you look in your place and you look through your organisations, through your parishes, I'm sure there are some phenomenal examples of how food banks have come together, of how um, Meals on Wheels have got to people, how people have supported with shopping, how they've supported with su providing GP connectivity, a whole host of things that potentially we wouldn't have thought about before. And I know speaking to many parishes uh, on, on events around emergency planning and looking at that, it was interesting that a number have shared with me that the people that they thought would have been the people that would come to the forefront in this current pandemic actually weren't the names or organisations that came forward. It was other people that came forward that had that real strength and real connection with place. And for me, it's how now through that community action, we look at how we can build on that and how we understand how those all those groups sit, where they sit and how they can help us all collectively to help uh, realise the vision for Cornwall. Moving on and lastly, we've then got um, community um, support and through that community support it really does build on what we've just been uh, we're talking through so it is very much around how do we ensure that we don't lose that great power of community action that we've we've, we've just all benefited from how do we make sure that they are given parity and that they're seen so that we are all sitting parish voluntary sector communities and council shoulder to shoulder and looking at how we most effectively use our collective power and opportunity to help make the local communities prosperous. So one of our challenges under the community support is how we help communities become more self-sufficient, more resilient. How do we help ensure that their voices are heard and that their talents and resources are supported and best seen? Um, already, I know speaking with Kelk, there are a whole series of options that we're looking at with NALC as well, of looking at how we can further enhance the support for town and parish councils and clerks and looking at how we can share best practice across one another. I know through the work that the voluntary sector forum have undertaken, of looking at how we're joining together through the work of Helen and the voluntary sector forum, the different voluntary groups, so that they can share and build on each other's expertise and power. 
So moving forward, this is very much around how do we invest in and invest doesn't necessarily mean financial, but invest collectively in that community support so that we can continue to draw upon and help support and develop that fantastic skill set that we have in place. Um, so moving on, the are the four key key areas. Um, if we move down, uh, if you look at the findings that we've discussed so far this morning, uh, hopefully um, you'll note that we've taken those findings across the county, across the country. Um, as you've heard from Councillor Sykes, Cornwall is seen in a good place, doing great things. Of course, it does mean that we have a huge spotlight on us, but the opportunity is significant. If we can get devolution working within Cornwall, then also the double devolution ask and asks of government and us being able to support that are so much stronger. We are fully parished, something other areas are really envious and jealous of. Speaking nationally to a number of colleagues, they still can't believe that we have that in place and the power and the base that that gives us. As Jesse mentioned, as I'm sure Helen will introduce shortly, we have a phenomenal and vibrant number of community supporters and groups already set up doing fantastic work in place. We have an opportunity to build new and strengthen existing relationships across our parish councils, voluntary sector forum, Cornwall councils and others so that we know we can recognise and draw on our collective strengths and skills and move our conversations into action so we are an, a strong learning alliance. And that really does support, I think, the key principles for me of where we are um, today is how we uh, share, how we develop and how we build the skills across our collective organisations and groups. We have the building blocks already set up around our communities. And if nothing else, this vision and strategy simply tries to build on that foundation and recognise what we have already have in place. It also outlines the commitment to continue to build on this for the benefits of our communities. So thank you very much. Um, and I will now hand over, if I may, to Sarah Mason from uh, Cornwall Executive, uh, Cornwall Association for Local Councils. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, are we moving to me rather than questions and answers? Should be My apologies, Sarah. Yes, it is questions and answers to Councillor Hannaford. Apologies. I'm sorry about that, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think it's high time we had some um, answers to the really challenging and interesting questions. I've been trying to um, sort of bunch them together and there are some key themes that are emerging. So one of them is about the, the tension between um, government's ambitions to build, build, build and planning powers and the impact um, on potentially um, having um, those powers removed from local communities. As a, um, as a council, we objected strongly to those and individually we have um, as well. So in my mind, bottom up um, community planning in the form of um, neighbourhood development plans and place shaping, um, I think is key to, ha to localism. So I think there is a bit of a mismatch there between, um, between the two. Um, so I completely agree with the sentiments that people have been making about what we do about that is is very difficult to um, to understand how we uh, affect that change. Um, I do know that officers in the planning department uh, and we've got our own neighbourhood plan in, in lieu and although it's not adopted, I'm really confident that um, officers are taking into account what's in my plan and we defend it, really defend it and make sure. Um, so it's around planning policies there. Um, there's one there about funding and capacity, especially of um, smaller town and parish uh, councils and also that sort of linked to um, how the um, whether there is passporting of budgets, 
and it's sort of linked to the capacity of the localism team to actually deliver, which came from, uh, I think it was Mark about that. So I was going to um, perhaps ask um, maybe Alan or Simon to outline what money is available, um, particularly capital money, um, to enable and to help um, devolution uh, uh, projects. And perhaps then Sophie could have a look, um, maybe talk about a little bit about the future role of the localism team and the capacity of that localism team. Um, and potentially, Sarah, I think you may have a view, Sarah Mason, that is about um, funding a capacity and how we can move that forward. Um, so if I could start with either Alan or, or Simon about um, funding and capacity for smaller town and parish councils. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hannaford. Um, so with regards to funding from a devolution perspective, um, we do have funding that is allocated to support devolution programmes and hopefully um, colleagues will acknowledge that we are working much closer now, uh, looking at how we can make sure that we can support and make sure those devolution projects um, wash the face and make sense. I think we have taken significant learning uh, from, from devolution deals and continue to do so. And are really keen that we make sure that when those um, uh, assets are handed over, they're handed over in a way that uh, doesn't have a negative draw on uh, the uh, host's um, finances and also looking as well at how we can link in other opportunities. I think there's a real point there when I spoke earlier about the 6,500 other premises. One of the things I'm, I'm really keen to do and, and, and for us to work across the system on is when we're talking about um, devolution, look at what other things may be on the table and how they may be able to help and also look at who else we might be able to bring into the conversation to look at different opportunities, which I know some, some um, town and parish councils have been very successful at, but also looking at how voluntary sectors to organisations may also be able to help join on the experience that obviously we've got with Jubilee Pool and how that moves forward. With regards to the other funding points as well, I think what's really important to note here as well is that this strategy has now been adopted across the whole of the council. So this isn't just about the localism funds or allocations, it's about how we most appropriately use the funding across Cornwall Council and across all of the services of when we're having those conversations and how we can draw on that. And I'm really looking forward to having conversations with colleagues um, moving forward on what that may look like. Hopefully that helps, Councillor Hannaford, thank you. Um, Jesse, do you want um, to, um, well, not Jesse, sorry, um, Sophie, if you're on the call, about the future of um, the localism team and perhaps the enhanced roles that the lo localism team could have. Um, I'm also seeing a comment that's got the most votes so far, um, which is about um, um, legal department uh, asset transfers. This came from Lana. Asset uh, transfer seems to be blocked by the inability of Cornwall's legal department to work at an accepted, acceptable speed. So the localism team is not just localism officers and it's not just Scott Sharples as far as devolution. It is the whole of the council and I agree um, we need to speed that up. So Sophie, are you on the call? Could you, is that something that you could address? Yes, of course. Thank you, Edwina. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sophie Hosking and I'm the Strategic Director for Neighbourhoods and the local localism team falls within my, my directorate. Uh, so it's nice to be here and thank you, Edwina. Um, yes, one, one thing that we've done recently that um, uh, the, the Cabinet um, agreed recently was to try and declog um, the whole process as much as possible by um, removing quite onerous conditions on quite a lot of devolution um, projects. So for example, in many cases in the past, uh, the council has required overage clauses to be put on or all sorts of conditions uh, and covenants to be included in transfers in order to, um, to protect the, uh, the assets into the future. The, the view that the, um, that the current administration has taken um, and, the, and, and that how we're trying to do things in future is to recognise that if things are transferring um, from, from, the local, from the Cornwall Council to other local authorities in terms of parish and town councils, those are absolutely democratically elected 
um, bodies that represent the people. So there seems to be no need, and certainly as far as I'm concerned, and I know the, the cabinet support this, to, to, to put in these onerous conditions which tie up our legal services, tie up parish and town councils, um, and, and aren't necessary. Because actually those assets are staying in the public domain. They are, um, they are still subject to uh, decisions made by publicly elected bodies. So why would we want to make it more complicated? So hopefully that will start to flow through um, so for all future devolution um, deals that we're looking at where it will only be an exception, a, a real exception, if um, to have any additional conditions imposed. Um, so that hopefully will will result in less um, complicated, um, drawn out, protracted wranglings as we as we devolve assets and make things a bit quicker. The question that um, was asked around the future of the localism team and resources, we're not, apart from a very small um, reduction in the budget due to the recent voluntary uh, redundancy programme, we're not looking at any reduction in the uh, in the budget going forward in the um, in the current medium term financial plan. Uh, I would also see the localism team paying a much bigger part in the council's move to um, more locality based working. And um, I'm happy to take um, to discuss with anyone outside of this meeting a lot more about that. Um, but in terms of how we work, the functions that we carry out in the community and it moving much to more towards a facilitating exercise, helping people to help themselves and and making the best use of our resources by not trying to do everything to everybody. And um, but but also coordinating council business a lot better. So I see the neighbourhoods director as being able to do work in localities on behalf of other services and directorates in the council. So if anything, it's probably an area within the council that's going to grow and the community link offices and the network areas will be absolutely fundamental to making a success of, of that programme. But as I said, happy to, to carry on that conversation outside of this meeting as well. Thank you, Edwina. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that. Am I still live? I guess I'm live now. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And the budget that's going forward to the council also doesn't have a reduction in the community chest as well, even though there's a reduction um, of um, number of councillors in the new administration um, after May. Um, thank you for that. Sarah, did you just want to make a comment on the um, capacity and funding and perhaps how we could move that forward, um, what we can do to um, help smaller town and parishes together? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hannaford. I mean, I think that uh, it it is always true that when a service is transferred through negotiation from Cornwall Council to the parishes, the cost of running that service ultimately moves with those who are in control of the service. Uh, and it's also true that uh, over the years, Cornwall Council has taken on board the fact that uh, the transfer, particularly of assets, um, without transferring some sort of capital to deal with the state of those assets, I wasn't an appropriate way to work. Um, I do know that, uh, we're, as has been echoed here today, we're seen as being uh, far further down the line in terms of that of that conversation about where things move from one tier to another. Um, but I think that it's for each parish to think hard about what the community wants it to do and then to work with Cornwall Council to find the best way of doing it. I know that funding will always be an issue and I know that where certain area services are hosted by an individual council, there's a reluctance for that whole area to join together to fund them. Um, and I do think that funding will always be the challenge. But what I would hope that we see coming out of this localism uh, strategy is that actually the spirit of localism uh, goes across all of the different services rather than resting with the localism team to try and get that echoed through the services. Uh, and in that way, you can each individual council will be able to have the the one to one conversation about what is right for their area and shouldn't feel forced into doing something which is beyond their capacity immediately. But we can develop ways of of uh, supporting them to make sure that if it's something they do want to take over, that it's done uh, carefully. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the other key thing that's coming through um, is um, climate change and why isn't it more explicit in this strategy about uh, climate change? Um, personally, I think climate change will only come through community uh, through community action. So this is an enabler. I think the uh, we need to look at um, the localism strategy uh, in the round of the council. We want to decarbonise. It's embedded in in our thinking. It's uh, about decentralising is definitely embedded um, in our thinking, in our recovery um, plans. So please don't, if it's not uh, writ large enough, it's certainly, um, it's no coincidence that my portfolio is climate change and localism, because I think the two are just made for each other. Uh, they definitely need to work together to make that happen. So um, it, it is implicit, even if you don't think it's explicit. And the other theme is about really is about double devolution. Um, Councillor Long and Councillor um, Gute, uh, missed the name now. Um, yes, Councillor Guterman, um, reconciling localism agenda. Uh, oh, that's about planning. I'm sure I saw another question from you. So Councillor Long, would you agree what we need is devolution rather than localism, as localism tends to carry financial control and true localism decision making. This is Westminster to Cornwall as well as Cornwall to Town Parish Councils. Absolutely, I agree, double devolution, but we can only work with what we've got. And um, as you've heard myself and Councillor Sykes highlight, um, we do have the ear of government. So we, um, we're seen as a safer pair of hands than most areas to test that. For me, it's about letting go. And I think us as an organisation, as Cornwall Council, have struggled to let go. Um, but I think it's the first time that I feel really confident mm. that we, we are starting to let go. And it, it's fine having a high level strategy that mm. says that. We mm. need to make sure that that filters down through all the levels of our organisation, through all the all parts of the organisation. Um, I think that's probably double devolution is probably Jesse's um, area of uh, expertise. Um, Jesse, would you like to comment on whether this will enable double devolution? Thank you, thank you, Councillor Hannaford. Um, I mean, what I would say on um, devolution from uh, Westminster uh, to Cornwall and then Cornwall on to communities is that um, I personally feel really proud of the way that Cornwall aims to walk the talk. So when we talk about the principle of subsidiarity, which is this really grand way of saying that decisions and powers should sit as close to communities as possible. Um, I think what 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 we see here is real work and effort going into making that happen in Cornwall. Um, and it's important, um, I, th I think what I hear from our kind of local leaders is that that's important to them, irrespective um, of whether it leads to more from uh, Westminster to Cornwall. Although, of course, we also work incredibly hard um, to stand up for Cornwall and make the strongest case for further devolution of powers um, from uh, national government to us. Um, so uh, we've we've got this very strong track record of delivery on our 2015 devolution deal which compares really favourably to areas with metro mayors, um, even though Cornwall kind of bucks the, the trend or the, uh, the national view on, on, uh, on governance models. Um, we've shown what rural areas can do um, and we're very much hoping that the government will honour its uh, commitment to publish a, a further devolution white paper that, that has been delayed. Um, but we are um, we are ready to make the strongest possible case for further powers when when that does come forward. Um, so uh, so yeah, but I, I I kind of wouldn't view the one as contingent on the other. I think it's important we live the values of putting power close to the community as well as standing up and calling on government to do the same. Thank you, thank you, Jesse, for that. I'm not sure where we are on timing, but I've got two other themes that um, <clears throat> are we OK for time, guys? Okay. Yeah, we could take 
two more questions. OK, um, so two themes. Um, one is about the local governments associations approach um, to localism. Um, I we did a bit of research into that and Councillor Sykes, if he's still on the call. Um, but I do know that um, the local government association are, are really aligned um, well, with Liberal Democrat policy, but also aligned with that. So they talk, the local government association um, talks about delivering better and more efficient services, better democracy and accountability, sustained improvements from regeneration programmes, strong, resilient and cohesive of, uh, communities, improved partnership working. So I think um, we're all aligned there. Um, it says delivering better and more efficient services. Services can be more effective and efficient if they're based on what citizens and communities want. And I think that's the essence of, of um, localism. Um, we can cir circulate um, their approach to that. And there was um, a question about um, street homelessness I see there. Uh, and another one about um, making sure that the ethos of localism is embedded in across the piece so not just Cornwall Council and its departments and um, the local um, calc and the voluntary sector but also in our town and parish councils so I'd like to think that this strategy and vision could be adopted by town and parish councils and we'd really like to work with Sarah uh, to make that happen and I think Councillor Laborde is making the, the, the really good point um, about getting out into our schools and our communities uh, to make sure that that ethos is there embedded across um, communities and not just in, in local government. Um, so as far as street homelessness, I think that's probably a Simon Jesse um, um, question. There was a, some conflict by one councillor who thought that um, we, we had different aims between the Cornwall we want and what's in the homelessness strategy. Um, I'm not sure whether you can answer this now or we can uh, respond to the councillor who asked that question. Um, is that something Simon or Jesse? Yeah, I, know. I can definitely provide a summary, summary answer at this moment in time. So, uh, but I'd like to be able to respond to it in more detail. Uh, if I may, but it, but in summary, obviously, in the current COVID perspective um, uh, and with government uh, direction, uh, we are still working with everyone in. So we are working hard at the moment to ensure that nobody should be sleeping out rough uh, at this moment in time, and we're doing everything we can to continue to support that through colleagues in in housing. Um, so uh, we, we will continue uh, to do that and continue to look at how as well uh, different accommodation provisions can be identified uh, for those individuals, which also includes moving on uh, provision and also the wraparound care as well that some of those most vulnerable individuals need to enable them to uh, get back uh, onto uh, their, their, their life track. Um, but if there's more specifics, I'll look at how I can respond to that in greater detail, Councillor Hannaford. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I can see that Jesse has responded um, to Richard Williams and to uh, Alistair Young from Coastline uh, who posed the question. So maybe we can do that offline. So as we move on, I think, oh, I'm so sorry, the postman arrived. One of the downs, shush, one of the downsides of life and working from home. Shush. Um, so one of the key things that seems to be coming across loud and clear across there is about <coughs> this tension between the planning system and the top down and the bottom up. And I can see that's linked to the climate change agenda as well, as people are talking about the use of best, the best use of land, often being in conflict with providing food uh, and obviously space for nature as well. So there is a tension there that I, I think perhaps when we come to do the more detailed work um, in the op more operational plan um, that we can start to bring those things together. Um, I think that covers most. Um, if I've missed anything, uh, perhaps you can repost because um, there are 50 published questions there and I'm struggling to get uh, to understand them all. Thank okay. you. 
another opportunity to um, for questions um, after the next two presentations. So um, I think we now need to hand over to our colleague Sarah Mason, County Executive Officer of Cornwall Association of Local Councils. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Edwina, Simon, and all those who put this event together. Um, so I thought rather than do a PowerPoint presentation, I'd just reflect on my view of localism over the last 18 months uh, since we uh, all met together up at the Wadebridge showground. And I gave my now fairly infamous mm -hmm. uh, talk and presentation on putting on your big pants and striding forward to do the best job with confidence that you could do. And we were all sitting in uh, 2019 planning for 2020. And for me, that included uh, a family wedding, two 60th birthdays, a big holiday uh, and lots of uh, travel. And instead, my key dates over the last year became the 23rd of March, the 4th of July, the 30th of November, and then finally the 4th of January. And they will be known as the, the COVID dates and the impact that they had on uh, our communities in Cornwall. Uh, and the other speakers have reflected on them, but I'd like to just put a bit of a spin on it because when we met in uh, Wadebridge uh, 18 months ago and we were looking at how to use localism to address climate change and to build on the partnerships so that together we could do something for our communities, uh, a lot of the feedback focused on the potential barriers that there were to us being able to achieve those aspirations. We were hesitant about how to work together. We were looking for ways uh, we all identified the limitations on our capacity, on funding, uh, on achievement, uh, on giving up the things that we knew that we enjoyed uh, in order to deliver real climate change. And then uh, the 23rd of March came along. And what that did almost overnight was to change the way in which we view localism. So instead of putting up the barriers to achieving or to finding the limitation, our own limitations, what we did instead was we focused on getting things done. Uh, we harnessed all of the partnerships, all of the people that we'd met along our journey over the previous months through uh, volunteers in our community, active local councillors, those that had got involved in neighbourhood plans, those that had got involved in the climate change movement, uh, local organisations, activists, you name it, they all came together with a single goal. And that goal was to find to have a can do approach to support supporting people in our communities, supporting vulnerable people who needed help, uh, listening to what people needed, hearing what they wanted and finding solutions by meeting their ask. And so when we look at this uh, last 18 months, our real achievement was that as organisations, we all needed to benefit from doing this together. We none of us had a single answer, none of us were able to provide a single solution. And instead we developed partnerships using the people we knew, using our networks in order to take care of people in our community and suddenly nothing became too big. And for me, looking back over that uh, last, tw uh, over 2020 certainly, that is the spirit of localism that I see harnessed in, in the work undertaken for the vision for Cornwall, uh, in the work undertaken to put the localism strategy together, but now it rests with us as local uh, parish and town councils about how we take that vision and how we preserve those things which uh, were identified in that massive consultation that had over 350,000 responses in one way or another. The CALC board, its executive board, has been part of the consultation process. It strongly supported the vision for Cornwall, even when uh, it had a few knocks towards the end of the development. Uh, and it wholeheartedly supports those seven key strands as being the way that we should all be uh, living our lives, supporting uh, our communities in Cornwall. And if we think about the Nolan Code and the principles in public life as for the way we approach our public life, then perhaps we should see the vision for Cornwall as being those seven key principles that should undermine everything that we do as local councils. Um, they see the vision as a way of actually challenging Cornwall Council so that uh, it can be held to account, but we must also uh, embrace the fact that it's a place where uh, communities can challenge all of local government in Cornwall, and that means uh, parish and town council sector as well. Uh, the speakers today have confirmed that Cornwall is seen as a front runner in, in localism, uh, and I would say that that is true. Whenever I go outside of the county, people are envious of what we have. 
Uh, even most recently, they're hugely envious of the unique funding support that Cornwall Council has offered to those parish and town councils in need. And that has come about through a localism approach of conversations and networking and support. Um, but the value that uh, I see in this document now is how we take those aspirations of the seven strands in the vision. We use the uh, localism strategy to call all of our partners and ourselves to account and how we make sure that we're trying to develop against those themes down on the ground. Um, and bizarrely, I go back to something which uh, back in 2003 was starting as I left being a parish clerk, and that's around parish plans. What is it that your community wants you to do for it? And as we come to the elections uh, in May for local councils, hopefully our journey over the last uh, 20 months is the place that we can start pulling more people in to come and help us be a vibrant sector delivering on behalf of our communities. Uh, I think that's thank it for me. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much uh, for, for, for your thoughts there. And an awful lot for us to uh, consider, I think, as we move forward again shortly into the, uh, the, into the next uh, questions and answers section. Just before we do, um, if I could, if I could now move on to Helen Moore Boardman, uh, Chief Executive for the Voluntary Sector Forum. Good morning, Helen. Good morning, Simon. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and uh, the privilege of representing the voluntary sector today at the launch. Um, just begin by introducing myself, Helen Boardman, the Chief Executive of Cornwall Voluntary Sector Forum, an organisation uh, many of my colleagues know. I joined day one of the uh, first lockdown and since then been very busy communicating and coordinating the voluntary sector response to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to just begin by saying a little bit about the context of the voluntary sector in Cornwall. And when I use the term voluntary sector, I am using shorthand to describe the voluntary, the community and the social enterprise sector in Cornwall. But just a quick look at the context in terms of registered charities in Cornwall. There are 2,500 uh, organisations um, recognised as registered charities by the Charity Commission in Cornwall, and they cover 38 sectors just within that sector. And um, they employ between them approximately 10,000 paid staff and they deploy around 87,000 volunteers a year. They draw in funds into Cornwall in excess of a half a billion pounds. And on average, uh, most charities employ around four staff and deploy around 35 volunteers. Most of these charities within Cornwall are much smaller. Where the voluntary sector is well placed to support localism's vision, to help it co-create and co-produce health, safe, and resilient communities. And in this way, localism becomes very meaningful to the voluntary sector. Next slide, please. Cornwall Voluntary Sector Forum's role is to give and amplify a voice to the voluntary sector so that they can really communicate their needs, ensure that the seldom heard are listened to and have a voice in that as well. We help organisations to positively influence, so that whole role uh, in terms of power to, um, to co-design local solutions and co-produce services that are, are tailored to support the needs of beneficiaries and residents. <clears throat> Excuse me. We help organisations to collaborate, to really play to strengths, and in doing so, engage in local democracy and public engagement opportunities. We also help them to collaborate through an alliance model, which I will um, talk about a little bit more later on. We help local people to take positive action, uh, sometimes described as social action, which helps to address issues and also to engage civically so they can live out their civic duty. I was really fascinated to learn in the Cornwall We Want findings that one in three residents wanted to actively and did actively get involved. So there's a huge appetite to play a team Cornwall role in Cornwall. 
We provide infrastructure support, which is a technical term to describe things like information, advice, guidance, learning and development opportunities in the sector. And we also coordinate a local Pan Cornwall Alliance, as well as a strategic and a number of thematic alliances, which were designed to create an interface between the voluntary sector and our stakeholders in the public sector and private sector, so that all together we could play an integral role in some of this uh, recovery and response that, that's underway at the moment. So I'm very privileged to speak on behalf of my members to amplify their voice on local issues, to talk about the needs that they have and also the aspirations which are important to them. Next slide four, please. When it comes to realising the four key principles within the localism strategy, the voluntary sector is really well placed to play this role. I've been very impressed at the way that the voluntary sector have dem demonstrated their ability to adapt and adjust uh, during this time to continue to support and care for the beneficiaries and residents. They're brilliant in ordinary, um, in ordinary sense at um, providing local people with places to go, things to do and people to talk to and no more so than at this time where people are shielding and isolated and really struggling emotionally. They are often chosen as the first point of contact for people in need and they really enrich community life. They bring their values, their principles around benevolence and altruism and efficacy into community life. And that helps to improve the quality of life for people. They really add value socially. Voluntary organisations are good at involving people in the design, the development, the delivery and evaluation of their services. So they're really well placed to extend power to and not apply a power over approach. They actively involve people in decision making processes. They're good at enthusing people, encouraging their participation in community life. We know uh, UK wide the absolute uh, incredible response to, to volunteer opportunities and no more so than in Cornwall, where we currently have 3,800 individual reg residents registered with Volunteer Cornwall as a pool that can be deployed to such things like the flu uh, vac vaccination programme and now we're seeing within the COVID vaccination programme. So the appetite to volunteer is incredibly strong in Cornwall and to engage in community events and social action too, which in turn we know builds social capital because it bonds and it binds and it links communities and, and creates networking opportunities which further creates community cohesion and integration and trust. And we know when trust is high in communities, crime is often very low. Voluntary organisations provide needs-led care and support in local communities through such methodology as outreach and drop-in approaches, structured activities and networking events, which further improves, as I've said, cohesion but helps re reduce isolation and loneliness and creates this sense of belonging that we all need. Slide five please. Um, and just one or two more slides further, just to say that the voluntary sector has played this amazing full and active role within the pandemic. They've been adaptable, resourceful, agile, innovative, entrepreneurial, resilient and robust. Pure determination to continue to help support um, local residents and beneficiaries. It's been incredible uh, to witness and be and be part of. Support such as practical support through food and clothing and shelter and bedding and books and toys and laptops to emotional support for those shielding, counselling, welfare checks, you know, just checking in regularly uh, uh, alongside very specialist support around bereavement, etc. and self-help. They've provided ongoing information, advice and guidelines uh, guidance through helplines and benefit advice and debt counselling, etc, etc, alongside, as I said, very specialist targeted intervention to the most vulnerable and the most disproportionately affected by the pandemic. As those um, community groups have surged in need, the voluntary sector has been quick to step up and help meet that need along with its stakeholders in the public sector. And again, I've touched on volunteers there around their assistance in some of these big programmes, as well as ongoing day to day volunteering for those um, people in need. Slide six, 
please. Um, I, I referred earlier to our pan Cornwall approach. We have a core cool local alliance of voluntary sector members who've stepped up and said, yes, we'd be willing to be the eyes and ears and the coordination point on the ground. And that's been quite amazing given how stretched they are on the front line and how much need and demand we've seen as a result of the, the crisis. In terms of the four key principles then, we've been identifying assets and deploying services, playing to strengths. We've been helping bring communities together to troubleshoot and agree collective approaches. We've been taking community action through collaboration, addressing gaps, avoiding duplication wherever possible. And we've been giving ongoing community support in the ways in which I described earlier. So locally, we've been staying very close to the needs of residents and their families and strategically, slide seven please, we've been helping to coordinate the larger services who are commissioned ordinarily to provide uh, care and support in various ways. Uh, in convening a voluntary sector emergency response alliance called VERA, we've created that strategic interface with Cornwall Council's governance system in the re response and recovery phase. And it's helped us to very quickly gather intelligence, triage that intelligence, and create this communication interface with our stakeholders. So they've learned firsthand what's happening on the ground, what's happening strategically, what are the issues, what are the trends, what are the emergency needs here? And, and very quickly, that's provided us with the agility we've needed tactically and strategically to play a full and active role in the Team Cornwall effort. And slide eight, just one or two uh, more slides to just reiterate that we believe in the sector that localism has the potential to strengthen communities and improve lives. We believe that the voluntary sector is well placed to make a vital contribution and is very committed to doing so. The past year has shown that when we combine our strengths and our assets, when we work to and play to values, we are much stronger, more robust and far more capable capable together, then we'll ever be alone. On behalf of the voluntary sector, I'd like to say thank you for including us in the code sign of the strategy. Thank you for inviting me to this event to you know, really raise the profile of the sector in this strategy to achieve that vision. And thank you for the spirit of one and all that cuts across everything that we're doing here. We really welcome the strategy. We really welcome its aspiration to power down, to ensure that local power and decision making is devolved as far as possible and put into the hands of local people. And I'd just like to conclude by saying we also uh, agree with colleagues when they say we need to ensure there's sufficient resource, no more so than in the voluntary sector, so that it can continue to support local people and play the integral role that it's found itself playing lately. We embrace the Together We Can philosophy, we embrace that it's at the core of everything we do and we are ready to re realise the voluntary sector's potential with you as integral members of the Team Cornwall approach. Thank you for listening and that's all from me. Thank you very much, Helen, for, uh, for, for your words. And um, I, I note in the sidebar, a number of people have already asked for your presentation, which will make sure that and all presentations are, are circulated along with the recording for today. So thank you very much for that. If I could please uh, just hand back over again to Councillor Hannaford, uh, just to coordinate the next uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Helen and Sarah, for um, your contribution. I think the the phrase that Helen used was Team Cornwall, um, and I think that's really important that this is not just Cornwall Council, not just Town and Parish Councils. We have to work in a team in the round. So thank you and thank you to all your the Town and Parishes that are doing such fantastic work and to all those um, community and voluntary sector organisations that are, uh, we couldn't do half what we do without uh, your input. So thank you. A um, couple of questions that I've picked up. Um, one is from Trevor Toms. Um, it talks about uh, green space devolved. Will the maintenance budget be devolved as well? Um, 
I've just looked up the local maintenance partnership. We have already 170 parish and town councils involved in that partnership and it says cash grants are made um, to them for that. Um, so there already exists a scheme for that. Um, I think the principle is around where there's a devolution of a, an asset. It's just to look at it in the round. So I think we're starting to move away from a lot of questions about car parking revenue as well. Um, I think we have to see how it benefits both of us and whether we can come to some kind of arrangement. So, for example, in my own community, um, we have put a levy or hope to put in a levy when they're actually charging um, on our car park potentially and that we keep that levy. So there's I'm not saying that is the answer and I'm not saying that uh, Cornwall Council won't share revenue, um, but I think we have to look at it in the round because we've got as a council our own challenges. Um, I'm wondering who else is best placed to talk about um, green space. Is that um, Sof uh, Sophie? Is that one for you about budgets and passporting and car park revenue? Thank you. Could you can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Um, which question? I, I'm confused with my chat bars. So which question um, uh, did you particularly want me to look at, Edwina? Right. You're going to have to come back to make me live, I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry. When I... Yeah, sorry. It's about if a CC asset is devolved, e.g. E a green space, will the maintenance budget be devolved as well? And there's a whole series of questions um, or comments about um, car parking revenue. Um, will the revenue gained locally from car parks be refenced? And devolved back to those communities. So it's it's all about um, it, it's all about the money, yeah. uh, which is a common theme. Yeah, and and this is a really difficult one for the council because in a lot of cases for Cornwall Council, we don't there there may not be a statutory duty to do something, and we're having to make some really tough decisions at the moment about whether we um, whether we just simply stop doing things, whether we make different use of pieces of land um, um, in order to generate income. Um, in order to support services such as adult social care and our children's services and our more statutory services. So we're, we're constantly having to, to weigh up um, how we use our money. Now, within this equation is actually what do our communities want to do with those pieces of land? And if there is a will to take them on, if we would otherwise have to close them, um, then absolutely we're going to pursue that. It doesn't, um, we will always try and make sure that we um, that we hand assets over either with a dowry or within within good conditions, so that there isn't a maintenance backlog behind that, so that we sort any um, legacy issues out. But we can't guarantee passing a revenue budget across with them to manage them because of all the other pressures that I've just mentioned that are our statutory obligations. However, every um, every discussion will be on a case by case basis. And also, if there's other ways of drawing funding in, we can. The one difference that we have, and I know this isn't a popular thing to say, but the one difference is between the town and parish councils is that our ability as a as a as Cornwall Council to um, to raise precept um, and money through public taxation is capped, whereas the local councils is currently uncapped at the moment. And this, um, therefore, you are in much more of a position to have a, a community dis discussion about how you might raise money for particular things. And there are really good examples throughout Cornwall and in fact throughout the country um, of councils and how they go about, local councils, how they go about having those conversations. So I'm not ducking the issue here. It's a really, it's a really tough one where we can, we will, um, but you, but in many of these cases, um, it's not to do with statutory requirements for Cornwall Council and we are being more and more limited as to how we can spend the money that we raise through the precepting. I hope that, I hope that helps Edwina. Thank you. So there's a slight delay uh, between one person speaking and the next person going live. So that's why there's a little bit of a, a gap in between. So thank you for that. Um, 
Sophie. So there's a question from Mario Dunn from Health Watch Cornwall with the creation of an integrated health and adult social care system also taking place. How can health feature in the localism plan? Health isn't, ma isn't mentioned. Well, there's lots of sectors that aren't mentioned because it, it's the principles of localism, but that doesn't mean to say anybody is excluded. Those same principles will apply whether that's health, whether that's um, across the piece. Um, and thank you very much for your offer to uh, work with colleagues to bring in a health focus into the work. I think that will come into next steps, but I'd quite like to bring in Helen Boardman because I know, Helen, you've been doing quite a lot of work with the voluntary, uh, your voluntary sector members around um, health and social care. Is that something you would like to comment on, Helen? Yes, Edwina, I agree. The principles are cross cutting. So, you know, I mentioned earlier there's 38 sectors just in the voluntary sector. And so it's how we sort of lift and shift and translate those principles to a particular sector. But when it comes to the health and social care sector, I have the privilege of being the third sector um, system leader on the integrated care system. And I work alongside my now colleague Mario in, in that sort of board and those programme boards. And it's our role really to help the voluntary sector understand uh, the vision for that integrated health and care and play a full and active part in that integrated care system. So there's a lot to be, do, to, to be done there, but we are well positioned now to work very closely with colleagues around that and ensure that the voluntary sector uh, it's meaningful to the voluntary sector. I hope as we move forward in helping to co-design the localism action plan that we can flesh some more of that out and, and take more of a sort of an intentional step around that. Thank you, Helen. That's, that's um, really good to hear. So just because your sector isn't mentioned doesn't mean to say that it's excluded. I think that's come across loud and clear. Um, from Launceston Town Council, can you confirm that localism in Cornwall will see the whole of Cornwall being equally respected when it comes to devolved service rather than what's happening now um, uh, with an east-west divide? Um, I'd really like to see evidence of that because absolutely no, that's not the intention. This is a whole of Cornwall. Um, I know there are some challenges that some communities don't have um, any assets in particular that are um, owned or managed by Cornwall Council, so there's little to devolve. And some communities have um, um, had all those assets already devolved. Um, but I'm really happy to have conversation, Launceston, uh, happy to come up there or to um, have a Teams meeting um, with Scott and uh, maybe Simon to understand um, what the issue is and how we can work with you um, so you can achieve your uh, ambitions. Um, more about planning, we talked about car parking um, revenue. Um, yeah, Sally Hurd, um, School for Entrepreneurs, um, I find that question I thought was quite uh, an interesting approach. So I'm having to scroll right back up for that one and I can't find it now, of course. Um, I think you were talking about looking at things in the round. It, it's not about, um, so everything is interconnected. So for example, there is a rural subgroup on the local enterprise partnership which is looking at the relationships between um, agriculture, um, access to food, our tourism um, offer, and seeing how, and the rural economies, to see how uh, that could be better integrated. I wish I could find her question, because I thought it was, um, we're up to 62 questions at the moment. Um, Sally also talks about bottom up and top down, and, and that is absolutely my background. I absolutely believe in that. I think communities do know best, but sometimes um, in the case of the National Planning Policy Framework, we've got this top down stuff that, are, that is standing over us and we can only work up to that. Um, that's why I, like other of my colleagues, would like to see far more planning powers uh, brought back um, to Cornwall. All oh, right, I found Edwina, it. Edwina, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. 
we just need to move on to the next section and okay. I know Sarah Mason wanted to come in as well if you wouldn't mind. Okay Sarah I think you wanted to make a comment. Uh, yes, I just wanted to reflect back on some of the conversations around uh, car parks, car park funding and devolution and the east west split or the perceived east west split, but also the, the comments that seem to be coming through on the chat box around the isolation felt in North Cornwall in terms of devolution and engagement. And uh, many of you will have heard me say before that that, you know, some of these things which are form the basis for discussion around the transfer of services are based on budgetary concerns. Um, but to highlight that those councils that rely on on revenue from footfall things such as car parks uh, to underpin their um, their budgets at the moment have actually found life, <coughs> excuse me, through the last 12 months really difficult. Uh, because when the footfall disappears, the income goes with it and you're still left holding the service. So this really is about, uh, I believe, uh, about deciding what your community really wants to have and going for it and using any income which happens to come with it to your advantage, but not relying on the, the driver for taking it on only being the income or the revenue or the budget or the funding that might come with it as many communities want to take back ownership of various parts of their community and run it for themselves. And there's a, a, a question, quite a long case study in the uh, questions around uh, the future of uh, Penn Hale and the camp there. And I think that's a classic example of where there's a community desire to take something back uh, for its own local connection rather than any funding that might come with it. Um, but for the east-west split, um, those parishes down in the west would say that the east gets everything. Uh, those in the uh, north will feel that everything is centralised around Cornwall. I think the beauty of this document is that it actually goes to show that uh, when you want to have a conversation in your area, where you are in Cornwall shouldn't make any difference at all. Uh, when you want to have a conversation about something in your area, your size, your ability and your capacity or the level of your precept shouldn't make any difference at all. What's important is that you've engaged with your community to understand what they want and then are the brokers of a conversation with whoever it needs to be, whether it's health or whether it's care, whether it's services, or whether it's open space in order to get the best deal for where you are. Uh, and that you shouldn't let where you are or how big or small you are be the barrier to that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That that's good. That's good to hear. This is a this is a strategy and vision for the whole of Cornwall. Um, and we want to have those conversations with you. Uh, we're very open to that. So next, I think I'm going to hand back to Simon Mould, um, who's going to talk about um, what happens next. Thank you, Councillor Hannaford, and thank you all. Um, for, for me now, this is very much a, a quick pause moment, really, and a, and a piece for reflection. So uh, we've heard a lot about the content of um, the document, um, but now it's a time for us to consider about what happens next and how do we want to take this forward collectively so that it isn't, as we discussed before, a command and control piece that sets a clear set of directions um, which has been devised by one of us. It's how we now say together, what does this look and feel like? How do we take this forward? So I'm very minded before it was interesting reflection on Sarah's point from um, looking back from Wadebridge. I'm glad we moved from big pants to Wadebridge conversations. But again, I think it was very interesting just to look at some of those challenges that we all put to each other when we, we met. And I think there was great optimism at that time. But actually now seeing the fact that the things that we said we wanted to do, many have been achieved in the way in which we work collectively together in place, sharing conversations, exploring challenges and looking at how we bring our collective resources together and how we help support communities uh, in place with communities. Um, I also think it was interesting listening and looking at some of the comments on the side around some of those real challenges that we've got around climate change and how we make sure that we bring those through. And absolutely, I know in this document it only touches light touch on that. But of course, I think as Helen mentioned earlier, um, there's a real opportunity now when we look at how we want to take this forward in um, the operational plan of how we collectively design that. You know, that's a perfect place for the home of the climate change piece to sit and how we can do that. So I'd very much be keen to understand how you would like to take this forward. Um, we've talked, heard as well about the health 
integrated systems, some of the opportunities there. So is it that we have conversations that are thematically led where we identify through this conversation now some of the key issues that you're grappling with, some of the key things that we want to talk about and we take the next steps collectively across the piece on how we do that forward. Or do we look at looking at them through the lens of each of the four uh, principles and start to look at that? I'm really minded that um, you've heard a lot about that, but it's important now of how do we make sure that this is meaningful for town and parishes? How do we make sure that this is meaningful for the voluntary um, sector uh, and in, in its broader context to make sure that it's relevant? How do we make sure that these conversations are meaningful for all residents, not just the uh, people we always think about, but thinking about children and making sure that they have a clear voice in what we collectively do and work on in place to support their long term futures and also how we make sure we address some of those unheard voices. I know that colleagues were speaking earlier about homelessness and again, how do we make sure that that is clearly understood? So very much over to you at, at this moment in time. I think there's been some fantastic uh, comments and also offers uh, thinking again about the um, Helen's offer around the Alliance model and maybe that could be something that we look at on how we can do that. I know uh, Sarah talked about uh, resurrection of parish plans or a new way in which we could connect in with communities. So for me um, it's now saying we've got the principles, we've got a document to which hopefully we all support and believe in something that is a mandate for change and something that we can hold true to and challenge each other over and I'm, I'm conscious that many will definitely do that of me and I welcome that opportunity. So now it's very much of um, in the comments bar if you wouldn't mind your thoughts on how you would like to take this forward. Is it uh, more of this? Is it smaller sessions? Is it thematic sessions? What are the ways in which you'd like to take it forward? And um, I'll pass back to Councillor Hannaford, if I may, for her to uh, just see if she wishes to draw on some of those key critical comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm looking in the chat bar to see what the most recent is. Okay, a lot of them. Okay, um, I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Um, my personal view, if you want my view, is um, I think we could have a mixture of all of the above. I think we do need to have um, um, about a number of themes that are common across um, across Cornwall um, and. I think we need to make sure and perhaps we use the community network panels for that with the voluntary sector as well that we um, perhaps use the community network panels for those conversations. Over to you really. And, and just while we're waiting for comments, um, Councillor Hannover, if I, if, if I may, uh, absolutely. I, I just, what I'm quite keen on, I'd be really interested in what I didn't want to do is go and, and set up a series of other um, events like this if there wasn't that support for them. So um, I think you're you're absolutely right, Councillor Hannaford. I think we can play this out through um, community network areas. I'm also interested though if uh, people think that, you know, having some focused one hour um, team conversations like this where beforehand we can write out to you, ask for some of the key issues or key things that you're trying to tease and, and, and get your head around and that we use those as a topic to explore and look at how we can build it. I think for me, one of the key things though that I'd really be looking for uh, from, from today is how we now underpin underneath the strategy a delivery plan that all of us own uh, and that all of us take a role in of how we deliver those issues. Um, and for me, it's just about seeking people's views on how they want to take that forward. OK, I've got some now. If you can make me live. OK, so we've got some uh, responses coming through now. Um, small interactive sessions. This is from Samantha from Camborne Town Council. Small interactive. I think that's a really good point because um, nobody likes to be talked at and we've talked at you quite a lot today. So I think it maybe needs to be um, um, not presentations, just free flowing discussions as much as that can be done on on um, uh, online. 
Um, John Carley would favour smaller breakout meetings, in my case, especially around the climate emergency. I'm with you, John. Um, oh, thank you, Councillor Rogers, um, for your enabling the launch to take place. Thank you. Uh, can the Community Voluntary Forum help voluntary safety groups relating to speeding? Uh, another question there. Um, I'm wondering um, whether it would be helpful to um, put out some kind of um, a, sort of a survey or some get some feedback. Um, we do have the community network panel chair meeting. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. That's a really good, um, good place. I like John Carley's um, uh, after MAGA, make America great again. Let's have the hashtag MAGA, make Earth green again. I like that. I may have to steal that one. Um, arranging e-meetings to enable parish councils and voluntary groups within the parish to take place. Um, thank you, Councillor Rogers. Uh, Mark Williams, focus conversation sessions as suggested by Simon. Um, and there is a, a point there from Catherine Heron, support needed for parish councils to prepare meaningful parish plans and to work across a matrix of issues sharing with other nearby parishes. So I think uh, Councillor Candy made the point that, that there should be a distinction drawn between uh, a neighbourhood development plan and a, uh, a parish plan, um, that they are two different animals. And I know um, back in my very distant past, uh, Carradon District Council really supported parish plans and we actually adopted them into um, planning policy, which uh, Councillor Candy will remember back in the day. Um, so it looks, uh, looks to me that the consensus so far um, seems to be around making sure we bring the voluntary sector, town and parish councils, voluntary groups in the community together, small focused sessions that are built around discussion and not lengthy um, presentations. Um, I think that's all I'm seeing and use the community network panels and the chairs meeting. Um, Stoke Climsland Parish Council a uh, big requirement, cheap training for councillors to get them on board, something quick and not too onerous to instill enthusiasm and point to solutions. I think that's um, that's all the um, feedback that I've had. Okay, yeah, I think that's about that's about it. So are we can we put a survey out um, just to capture others views? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that, Councillor Hannaford. So I think what is quite clear is I think that the, the small the small focus groups seem really powerful. So that seems to be the right thing. I think as you quite rightly said, I think the importance is to make sure that we get all the right people there. So again, I think it would be a permission piece that if we set those sessions up, actually um, it's for, for us all to make sure that we might pass those invites on to the most appropriate people that we're aware of and that we uh, draw on the, the local networks that we have to, to look at that. I think to inform the, uh, the work programme, what we'll do, as you've quite rightly said, if we drop out a uh, quick questionnaire to everybody, uh, just asking for their uh, top five uh, priority areas of focus that we could all come together and look at. Um, and I've, we could then start to look at that. And I think it would also be useful if there's anybody that um, you think would be really critical to have at those meetings or somebody you think that's really grasp, grasping it well and has got some great ideas and that we might want to get behind them to help them understand how to do it. So I think if we form something along those lines, that would be absolutely super. Um, also, just the last point, um, Councillor Hannaford, that you just raised is I'm also minded that this isn't a, an, an environment that all of us feel comfortable in. Uh, working in a in a remote way. So again, if there's a session that we could do or a series of small sessions that we could offer out of just helping people feel familiar with using this technology and how we can engage on it, it might be that we do that first as well as a bit of an icebreaker so that then when we move into the themes, people feel comfortable in this way of working. So again, if there's other ideas that people have uh, of how we might be able to do it or any tools that you've read about, um, please, please share with us and we will help facilitate and create those conversations. But of course, they're conversations that all of us need to own. So um, thank you very much for that. And um, 
Councillor Hanover, if I may, if I hand back over for the close to yourself. Thank, thank you very much, Simon. I can see one more uh, from Councillor Ian Stewart, small topic specific meetings to exchange practical ideas and how to put policies in practice. I think there's a little bit of a consensus coming um, through there. Um, so my final task is to thank all the presenters in our partners. This really is a Team Cornwall uh, approach. As an administration, we are committed uh, to localism and devolution and giving a voice to our communities and working with you to make um, your aspirations and what you want within your communities happen. Um, you'll see on screen there um, email address localism at cornwall.gov.uk. Um, we will make sure that uh, all the recordings and the presentations uh, also are circulated um, out to everyone. And finally, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much, Councillor Hannaford. Thank you all.